there's somebody you should meet. This is Leia Borromeo. Leia is an all-round badass. She owns her own company. It's a documentary film production house. She's a badass female journalist. And she happens to be Filipino-American. Has a lot to say about that. Leah and I met in London not too long ago for the first time and we hit it off directly and we ended up talking about a somewhat unlikely topic which is brown privilege. Now some of you might have already heard of the term white privilege. White privilege is defined as, let me look this up here, it's the inherent advantages possessed by a white person on the basis of their race in a society characterized by racial inequality and injustice. Okay, but Leah and I, we wanted to take that idea a little bit further. So here we were, two children of immigrants with parents who were way too overqualified to do the work they were doing in the countries they immigrated to. Both Leah and I have more or less successful journalism careers both of us went through a Western education system and both of us, we come with a sense of empowerment and entitlement. We know what we want and we're not afraid to ask for it. Our education and our parents' education, that is actually our privilege. And so we thought maybe it's time to ask in what way are we privileged and in what way could this be brown privilege and what does that mean and what is our responsibility? Okay, so. Lea was born in the Philippines, in Manila. But in the early 80s, the political situation there got so heated that Lea's parents packed up Lea and they moved to the US. They had a visa only for the three of them, meaning that they had to leave behind her three siblings. But it's not all easy, you know, moving to the US as a fresh immigrant in the 80s. A visa wasn't enough. They actually had to find a sponsor. So Lea's mom, packed up the little kid, and they traveled throughout the country on a Greyhound bus trying to find a sponsor. No need to worry about driving when there's someone you can trust. Go Greyhound and leave the driving to us. While my dad stayed in San Francisco trying to find you know, other ways for us to be able to either maybe go back to the Philippines or see how, how we could possibly stay in the States. And so we were, you know, we, when eventually my mom found a sponsor in Chicago and we decided to move there. And I remember being there in the middle, dead of winter in Chicago, having come from Manila. You know, and it's like, what is this white thing? You know, and what is this? And that's not just the people. It's like, this, what's this cold? What is all this, you know, what is all this stuff? And yeah. we were sleeping in people's garages. We were sleeping in people's kitchens. We were sleeping on sofas and spare rooms. You know, we were basically pretty much turfed from one bed to another. Um, every two or three days, homeless, going around, you know, looking for a place to live. And we eventually found a place to live, but didn't have central heating. So when my dad joined us, we were sleeping in the kitchen with the oven on. Uh, health and safety and you know eventually we managed to find some work we managed to you know, my parents managed to find you know any old job my dad had a university degree my mom had a doctorate in theology um, hugely overqualified um, she used to memorize books when she re when she read them and she could just recite them, like one after the other and you know she had a big old brain Wow and expected mm, <laughs> quite a lot out of me for that. So, you know, on these Greyhound buses, she taught me how to read. She taught me math. She taught me my multiplication tables, age five. <laughs> wow. I learned long division. You know, I learned percentages. I learned all of these things before I even stepped into kindergarten. <laughs> you know, again, that was a privilege that I had because my mother was educated and we were dirt poor. And I still had a slight Filipino accent in my language, but my mother, made me watch American television programs mm -hmm. like like Remington Steel for instance uh, and I love just that. wasn't that Pierce Brosnan? Oh my gosh. Oh my, my God. first my first Mr. Steel. Dinner in a movie Mr. Steel? Mr. Steel? Yes. We'll settle that question between the two of us. I hear you Mr. Steel. You too Mr. Steel. 
remember the first moment where you kind of start realizing that you have privilege over other people from other places in the world or other, you know, people of color? I... kindergarten. Really? That was kindergarten. It's because I already knew things that my classmates didn't. Huh. So you felt like you had an advantage? I was always told by my mom that I did. This was something that she had drummed, like, she just drummed into me, that you are in a pretty shitty situation now. Yeah. We have no money. We walk places because we can't afford the bus fare. So I was born into having everything. Yeah. Had all that taken away and suddenly brought up with nothing. And, you know, I remember, like, dragging home laundry with my mom and, you know, washing that and helping her do all of that, taking that in and helping her clean people's houses. And, you know, so I was working with her, wow. carting a lot of these things along. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of why I'm a little bit of a neat freak now. <laughs> and I do know how to clean with a lot of I things. I can attest to that. Yeah, but it's, it's like... It's nice, though. <laughs> But it's, it's, you know, so I, I was always told by my mom that although you find yourself in this situation now, this is where you came from. And the same thing with my dad. My dad always sort of taught us about the possibilities of things. I remember him once, and he did this a couple of times, and the last time he did it was before I went to university. And I might well up now. Mm. But we'd go outside, and he had, you know, he has this sort of knowledge of the constellations and of the stars. and. He looked at the star and he goes, the stars, and he goes, hey, just pick one. And I go, and then he'd tell me what that is. And he'd tell me where it is, and he'd tell me where it was placed, whether it was on Orion's belt or anywhere else in, in some kind of, on Sagittarius or whatever. And he goes, you know that star? Yeah, you can have that one and any of the other ones you ever want. That's, um, yeah, Ugh. goosebumps. It is goosebumpy, and I kind of, I well up with that knowledge that my dad and my mom, like, you know. That's amazing. That's amazing that they made you believe that you could have it if you wanted. Like, you just work hard for it and you get it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do well up with this because it's kind yeah. of like, it's, 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 it's definitely something that I, I know as a privilege. My colleagues, my contemporaries don't have. To be honest, I, I never really felt super privileged. I, I, I wasn't told I was, that I was, I wasn't. Um, but I'm now at a point in my life where I have worked certain jobs and I've seen certain things and I've met certain people and I've made certain connections and my education brought me this far that I know I am more privileged than a lot of people. Um, I mean, I was... I, I don't think I n knew back then how lucky I was when my dad made me, you know, like, um, like learn all the capitals and all the countries of Latin America during my summer break and <laughs> Africa. And like, he's like, what are you doing for the TV? Learn this. <laughs> and so, and then he tests me. That's what it's like to have a teacher parent. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> At the time I thought I was, I was being punished. I hated it. <laughs> Now I know that it's actually quite a privilege to have it. Um, I'm wondering, with our privilege, like, is it good? Is it bad? Is there? Should we even put any value on that? And and how? Like, because it doesn't make. Yes, it makes our life easier, but it doesn't mean we don't have to hustle real hard. Still, I mean, with everything that we have, we will always face some kind of difficulty, right? So we could have been uneducated and then we'd have to deal with the struggle of being uneducated and still have to survive and still have to find a family and still, you know, or, or fund your family, fund your lifestyle, or fund whatever it is and, and get by. Now that even though you are educated and, you know, you went to some kick-ass university on a, on a scholarship uh, yeah. and I went, I went to a kick-ass high school on a scholarship mm -hmm. and, you know, my, my parents basically yeah, I, I got sent to a fancy art school 5,000 miles away from home, but they crowdfunded pretty much all of my money and all of my maintenance wow. from everybody in the family. So I was sent there with this burden at the age oh. of 18 going like, this is not, this money that you have is not ours. You know, it came from, they said God, but th it, I knew it came from, you know, this mm. myriad of sources, uncles, aunties, cousins, tertiary cousins, you know, secondary this, first that, 
people from church. There was a fundraiser for me to, you know, just to, to send me off to college. All sorts of different bake sales, everything. Oh my God, that's such a heavy burden, though. Yeah, and it's like, okay, go and do well. <laughs> and I'm like, eee. got it. <laughs> no, no pressure then. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah, you could argue. Fine, I got sent off to a fancy art school, but yeah, definitely. Oh, it was the price, like not just literally the price, but. Like community-wise, socially, yeah. the price. The, yeah, I had, you know, I, I have had this thing go in my head that I've been a bad Filipino, I've been a bad immigrant, I've been a bad, you know, bad person of color, I've been a bad everything else because I had the gall and the gumption to go off and do what most 18-year-olds do when they leave home is, mm. yeah, you go out, you get drunk, you yeah. meet boys, you do all sorts of different things. Yeah. Um, Bad immigrant. Bad immigrant. But then, again, my dad, on his little star thing or whatever it was, my mom was insistent that I would be like her and graduate magna or summa cum laude or whatever it was. Um, my dad just said, you have three years to pretend to be an adult. Hmm. And I said, yeah, I do. He goes, don't mess it up too much. Um, okay, so with our privilege, I'm trying to think... Is there something we can do to, or is it even on us without sounding condescending or it's such a touch, touchy topic, like, to, because then it comes to almost like a white savior situation. Like, is there something oh. we should be doing? Well, a brown savior thing? Yeah, a brown savior, like, to, to give others that same privilege or, or to, yeah. I think as journalists particularly, we find ourselves in a position where We've somehow lucked out yeah. in somehow making a living, just. Um, Not really. Yeah, just. <laughs> um, asking questions and being a pain in the ass. Mm. And, you know, we were the kids that kept asking, why, 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 as kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we were those annoying, pesky little fuckers <laughs> um, who always wanted to know about a little bit of something and who weren't really afraid to get into trouble to find out about things. Mm -hmm. Um, we would be the ones sneaking into places. We would be the ones kind of like, you know, going behind the teacher's desk and checking uh, what's, yep. whatever's in their drawers. Um, and, and, and I don't know any journalist who hasn't done this. I don't know any journalist who hasn't, you know, gone above and beyond, shall we say, um, a few kind of moral lines yeah. when it came to things. Going through empty hallways and museums and just checking if all the doors are actually locked. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We've done that. Actually, my mom did that and had us in tow. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly that. That's so awesome. Yeah. 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 And it's, it, you know, we are in a position where we can make it our business to be nosy. And we make it our business to ask a lot of questions. And we tend to, we are able to, we should be able to, see things from different perspectives. And it's a luxury to ask those questions. It's a total luxury to ask those questions because not everybody can. No. Would you, so, in short, would you mm, would it be fair to summarize this as we can use our privilege to ask all these questions to help educate other people who are less privileged, possibly, and lift them up that way, or offer ourselves as a resource for that? Yeah. Should that be required or yeah. needed? Um, I've always found it a bit slightly problematic saying, oh, I, I here have has some information and I got some information and you got to have it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and my information is more important than your information. Right. And actually it's not, you know, it's all kind of important, but it depends on what you're going to use it for and what you need it for. And we're tools, you know, that's, we're functionaries, we're tools, we're, we're, we're nothing more than that. Yeah. So in which way is that different from what, what people who are, um, who represent white privilege can do? Like, well, let's, let's double back on this because the, the subject here is right. brown privilege. So what privilege have we got? What can we see? What do we have access to that right. whitey doesn't? Don't? And it's these narratives. It's, it's, it's actually these sort of the narratives of the diaspora the narratives of mm. those who are struggling. And this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, just because you're brown, you have a greater privilege in this, uh, you, you basically own suffering as your, as your tale, because you don't. 
you know, there are a lot of white working class people out there who definitely have probably suffered more than either you or I have, yeah. could ever hope to have. And, you know, they too are as valuable, if not, you know, in certain circumstances, more valuable um, in terms of what, what stories they have to tell. Mm -hmm. So we have to be mindful of that. Just because, just because the information's coming out of a brown mouth doesn't necessarily make it any better or any more valid. You know, you have to look at where they came from, whether or not they acknowledge they come from privilege. Because some people like to use and capitalize and manipulate people's sort of perspectives on it using the semiotics of the signs of where they come from to their own ends and to their own benefit. Mm. I don't know how to end this. How should we end this? How should we end this? Just as a reminder for people, I suppose, to um, the next time you see a brown face <laughs> serving you anywhere, at a McDonald's or at a fast food, at a Harvey's or driving your Uber or doing something like that. Just ask them what are they overqualified to do? You know, because there used to be a guy at ITN where I used to work years and years ago. He used to deliver our teas and coffees and I found out he was Filipino. I was like, hey, where in the Philippines are you from? And he's like, oh, I'm from here and yada yada. What did you used to do? He goes, oh yeah, I used to be the head of police in this particular town. And I was like, oh geez, and now you're serving me my coffee. And I get this all the time when, you know, whenever I'm in an Uber driver, some guy, you know, has a degree in graphic design and mm. in engineering or was a professional basketball player or was something. So somebody was always something somewhere. And, sure. you know, it's just because they're currently in a position where they're effectively serving you or in a service profession that doesn't make them less than you. I tend to notice, you know, the arrogance and the hubris with which certain people treat people within the service professions. Um, yeah. Completely ignorant of the fact that that brain that they're sharing that space with is probably bigger than theirs. And there's a lot that they can learn and that you can learn from just asking the right questions of people in the space that you're in. Yeah, just listen to their stories. I think that's kind of it. Um, okay, I think that's it. Thanks, Leah. And I'll <laughs> link your film below once it's out. I hope it's out soon. All right, people, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. And if you did, please don't be afraid to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and, you know, share it and tell your friends and family. Um, you know, I'm just getting started, so this week's video was a little bit longer and, you know, a little bit more personal. Maybe uh, in a few weeks, the next video will be a little bit shorter and a bit more lighthearted, and that's fine too. I'm just trying things out, so bear with me. Tell me what you like, what you hate. And um, if you know anybody that I should talk to about this, t you know, diversity and integration and representation and assimilation and all the Asians, please let me know and link me up with them. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter, etc. Also, um, I'll be linking Leia's film below as soon as it's out. It will be amazing. And also follow her on Twitter. I'm gonna link that as well. She's pretty funny. Okay, that's it for me. I'll see you soon. Yalla bye.